Welcome to the first edition of Campus Conversations with the President. These will be a series of conversations with people from around the campus who are making really important contributions to Rice. This, of course, is our centennial year, and so we're happy to be beginning these conversations. We just arrived back on campus after the summer in some respects. Our students are coming back, and some people think of the campus as a quiet place during the summer, but actually it's a busy place during the summer with the research that our faculty are doing and often traveling to conferences and other events around the world. And we're pleased to begin this set of conversations with one of our most distinguished professors, Dr. Balikul Ajayan, who's a member of our material science uh, faculty here at Rice and recently got a lot of attention for his laboratory with the invention of spray paintable uh, battery, a video now on YouTube that's gotten well over 100,000 views. So it's my great privilege to welcome Dr. Ajayan. We're so pleased to have you here with us today and talk a little bit about your work and your experience here at Rice. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. It's obviously nice to be the first one uh, on the show, and uh, I'll be glad to talk about a lot of things, a lot of exciting things happening in my lab. Well, your video has uh, <coughs> uh, of the work in your lab really set a, a new record for us. Um, and, uh, people are excited and excited around the world, not not right. just excited here at, at Rice. Well, I think you know people like things that uh, bring in paradigm changes. Uh, you know, lithium-ion battery has been used around the world. All of us use it in computers, and there's a huge market for this. What we try to do is to really think differently on how you can design something like this. So rather than having you know everything packaged in a canister and going into the uh, a particular design space in a computer, we decided to deconvolute everything, uh, all the components in this battery, so that you can spray, paint, or print pretty much anywhere you want, any surface, any geometry. So it kind of expands the horizon of what you can do with uh, energy storage devices. It's amazing how something that on the one hand is quite practical has captured the imagination of people. It's the, the creativity and the science coming together. Absolutely. You know, on my website I say, science is our passion and creativity is our mission. Uh, that's great. <laughs> well, I'd like to maybe begin a little bit by sort of how you got to this point. You've, you've assembled an extraordinary group of people, really, who work on a variety of projects. Um, you've been at Rice, as I understand, about five years now, and somewhere all this uh, started in Kerala, India. Is that, is that right? Yes. I was born in the southern part of India, a uh, state called Kerala. Did my basic education there, and then I went to Benares in the university in the north to do my undergraduate uh, through the IIT entrance exam. Uh, and then five years that's there. That's the exam that that's the exam only two percent or less pass that exam. Right. I think when we were taking that, there was only five or six IITs, and uh, out of hundred thousand people, about two thousand got it. That's amazing. Right. So it's it's a very competitive exam. Uh, now the IITs have expanded. There are several more, and uh, it goes with the expansion of educational institutions in India. Uh, but anyway, I did my undergraduate in metallurgical engineering in Benares, uh, universi Hindu University, and then came to graduate study, as most of the IIT students did those days, uh, to Northwestern University in Evanston, Chicago. Uh, there I continued materials, metallurgy-based uh, uh, activities, and did a PhD in material science. And my background was uh, electron microscopy, where you really look at atoms and very small systems. Of course, those days, nano was not a buzzword, so uh, and my thesis was kind of called uh, evaluation uh, of small particles. You know, nano came a few years later. Uh, but then again, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to go from uh, Evanston to NEC Corporation in Japan, uh, and fortunate enough to be in a lab uh, which is the place where carbon nanotubes were discovered. So I was in this uh, nanotube uh, early developmental phase of that whole area, and uh, you know now this field and continuation of that field like graphene and other things have expanded and it's become and a huge And did you hear field. about the work that was being done at Rice and yeah, technology yeah. at a pretty early stage? Or? Well, of course, you know, we, we were familiar with uh, Richard Smalley who was uh, uh, the Nobel Prize winner and he used to visit us very often because nanotube was kind of a continuation of the fullerene mm -hmm. with more potential for applications. So Smalley and INEC had a pretty good connection. I saw him several times at INEC. 
Um, so we knew the exciting things that happened in the fullerene discovery at Rice. Uh, once again, you know, there was no nano word there until you know several years later. Um, so my background and experience have kind of covered various things, but with a basic um, focus on materials discovery, characterization, and recently, you know, several of the applications that these materials would ultimately lead to. I want to come back to that in a moment, but uh, so you were working at NEC. H how did the transition into academia occur? I think I always wanted to be a professor. It was more like a you know postdoctoral training. Uh, the the reason why I went to I, um, NEC Corporation was uh, there was a researcher Ijima who was credited with the discovery of nanotubes, who visited Northwestern when I was just graduating, and we had a long talk. And he was kind of working in the similar fields that we were, and. I mean, it didn't occur to me twice, you know, uh, about not going to Japan at that point. Uh, I was always interested in basic research, and this was an opportunity. And as I traveled, you know, went to NEC and later on to Europe, uh, kind of realized that, you know, this is an area where language is not a barrier. You know, everybody speaks the same kind of language. Well, it's amazing when one sort of looks at your background, you know, <coughs> born in India and educated through undergraduate education. and in India and then came to the United States for your education, spent time in Japan, in France, and in, in Germany. So you kind of have a really global background in terms of your experience. And of course, you maintain all of those contacts. I know you, you have affiliations with universities in China and, and Germany. So I, I want to take the opportunity to kind of get your thoughts on the, this connection between scientific research right. and engineering advances and, and the global environment in which we operate. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an interesting question because uh, I don't have to really go abroad to see that. You know, if I look at my own lab, there are people from 10 different countries. Right. So for a long time, <coughs> even when I was a graduate student at Northwestern, this is the way we did research. You know, people from all different countries came here and worked together. Um, and of course, you know, when you go abroad, you do see small differences in how um, things are done, how specific milestones are achieved. Um, maybe, you know, in Europe you have more focus on fundamental research because you can do more sustainable research uh, from the funding that you receive. But in general, you know, uh, as I was mentioning, there is no real language. Everybody seems to be looking to uh, find new things and, you know, exciting things that would change the world. So is this mostly sort of people finding the best people in their field and institutions which are doing different things and, and somehow bringing together those experiences and strength in order to draw on the best of the best, so to speak. I, I think so. Uh, I mean, of course, the people who come uh, here to do graduate studies are screened and they're probably the best that you, you know, that, that come from these countries. Um, but, but again, um, as you go to other places uh, and look at what is happening, Th there is this broad spectrum of uh, uh, things that you can easily get integrated with. Uh, and this is what we have been doing in, in my own group, you know, sending students abroad. Uh, it's, it's an experience that you get in addition to just the science that you do when they are there. Uh, because, you know, you start believing, well, uh, going back a little bit, you know, to me, science is about thinking broadly, thinking liberally. And I think, you know, the more you see uh, different cultures and different approaches to doing the same thing. I think the students also get this breadth of uh, the approach that, that you can. You so know. this comes back really to your earlier remark about the, the role of creativity in science and right. imagination and constantly thinking outside the, the boxes that we think about, which in some ways led you to think about the battery in a completely different Absolutely. way than you thought about. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in academics, we are mostly involved in basic research, and the only way you know, discoveries can be made is really, as you said, thinking out of the box. And this is what I always tell my students, you know. This is a time for you to really think aloud and, uh, you know, come up with some crazy stuff. Well, I <laughs> wanted to ask you about that because, you know, your work, you, you started with this interest in the st structure of matter, matter at the sort of very tiniest scale. And, and so much of your work derives from the fundamental understanding mm -hmm. of how matter is composed and how particles behave at, at, at the nano scale. Right. And then you've moved that knowledge to these very interesting 
applications. The most recent one that, that got a lot of notice was the spray paintable battery, but some of the ones that emerged also fairly recently, for example, the boron infused uh, nano sponges, which could absorb oil and the, the coated, the magic sand that uh, uh, can remove uh, impurities from water. So these are, you know, these are kind of <coughs> applications that we think of in some ways as more traditional engineering, even at the nano scale. So I, I wanted to ask you about how you see in your own work that that relationship, that, that how the, the, the importance of that breadth between fundamental research and application and, and how you see that for the future in terms of, for example, even what our country's priorities should be in terms of where we choose to make scientific financial investments in science. Right. So, <coughs> you know, material science is a field that lies somewhere in between very basic research and applications. In fact, uh, somebody said, those who control materials control technology, right? And you can see that happening, you know, o over and over again. You know, if you look at the important things that is happening, solar cells, desalination of water, uh, energy storage, they all require new materials. So my interest and the way I have thought this over years is basically to develop this connection between, you know, the very basic science, which is the, the state of matter, uh, maybe a few atoms, clusters, and the larger scale, which is related to more applications. So this uh, this connectivity to me is what is nanoscale engineering. Uh, and I think most of our activities are related to uh, this, you know, not just building the building blocks, which are these small clusters, but to really get to the next stage through this engineering. You know, engineering at the nanoscale is quite different from typical engineering because there are concepts like uh, bottom-up engineering, where rather than machining things down, you try to take individual particles and put them together. So it's a, it, the whole uh, engineering is very different yes. in its approach. Uh, and most of these applications that you mentioned, you know, these are all kind of new look into how we can approach different applications, whether it is the water purification uh, or whether it is the sponge that absorbs oil the nanoscale uh, inks that would allow you to paint the battery, or even the blackest material. Uh, you know, th these are all uh, because we were able to engineer, you know, structures and integrate different nanoscale structures uh, into uh, useful product. Um, so all, all of them, I mean, again, my overall focus for me in my lab is uh, this nanoscale engineering. Uh, it, it's very challenging because these are extremely small objects, and the question is, you know, how do you really build uh, uh, macro scale objects or structures from such tiny particles? But I take it a lot of what you do is with this deep understanding of matter at the nano scale, of course, materials, yeah. and and the way adding things to those materials might affect their properties is right. is then thinking about what are the new applications, what are the things that these materials could actually do. I want to get to the spray paintable battery in a moment, but you, you mentioned this darkest material, which was very intriguing. You know, it set a record from the Guinness Book of World right. <laughs> Records. You, you probably didn't start out with that idea no, in no, mind, no. But, <laughs> but I was curious, because uh, it's not apparent immediately to people, uh, why did you pursue the darkest material? What, so what, it was what your hopes for that? It's an interesting anecdote. Uh, you know, we, we, we used to make these aligned carbon nanotube arrays in, in the lab, uh, Rensselaer, when I, where I was there. And one day we were just looking at uh, uh, you know, a, a, an array of nanotubes which was made slightly differently. Essentially we wanted to make the density of this array low. And it looked very, very dark or very black, you know, almost bluish. And I, I thought to myself, you know, uh, how is it different in terms of how it looks from the other structures that we have been making? Very similar structures, right? Then I had a uh, you know very good uh, uh, colleague who used to actually look at uh, optical absorption, and his field was optics. So I went and talked to him. I mean, is there any way you could actually quantitatively analyze the darkness of this? So. He told me, yes, you can, but it'll take me a year or more. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I need to get some more equipment to do this. Uh, but he was interested, and you know, uh, things like that obviously would interest anybody uh, who is in science. Uh, so we had this long uh, you know, couple of years of work that ultimately uh, you know, measured the total absorbance of light 
uh, in these arrays, and obviously we found that it is uh, you know the, the total absorption is very high. And again, you know, very simply speaking, it's it's kind of curious. Uh, it's basically made of graphite or carbon, right? Uh, and when you make a very low density array of nanotubes, what you're doing is essentially taking a lot of carbon out and putting air into that material, right? Uh, the question is, if you remove a lot of material from uh, apparent material, how is it that going to be make it? You know, how is it going to make it darker? So there are some theories that say that if you decrease the uh, uh, dielectric constant uh, and the refractive index, uh, you could actually get uh, uh, low reflection. But of course, getting low reflection is not enough because it, uh, the light has to also penetrate deep so that it can absorb fully, and it depends on the dielectric constant of the medium. So you know, uh, you have to actually not only make this uh, array of nanotubes, you know, very low density or very porous, but also deep enough so that the light is actually trapped. So all we did was. We knew there was nanotube, and taking that nanotube and creating some kind of a periodic structure that acts like a metamaterial that traps light. So I, I was just saying this because the engineering part is very important. You know, nanotube, a single nanotube or a random array of nanotubes wouldn't do it, right? So the next generation is, or the next step is to actually do this controllably so that you can get a periodic structure, which is by many people called metamaterial. Hey, that's a great story, and I, I take from that a couple of lessons about science. And one really turned out important for the whole development of nano nanoscience and nanotechnology, which is, you know, something seizing upon something you didn't necessarily expect to mm -hmm. observe, and and being right. sort of comprehensively observant and taking advantage in some ways of an accident. And you saw something and said, "Well, that's kind of interesting." And at least as I understand the history of the development of carbon sixty. It, at Rice, it was almost that kind of right, observation. Right, absolutely, yeah. Instead of saying, "This, I'm not interested in this weird thing," it's that fundamental curiosity that says, "The weird thing interests me, even if it's not the thing yeah. that my experiment's about." In some that sense, that is, you know, on the dot, basically. So many times, students come to me and say, "Okay, this experiment didn't work." Uh, so I start telling them, you know, uh, at least you should think why this experiment didn't work, or you know, maybe look at the product. Even if you didn't get what you wanted, maybe this is more interesting. Right. And that's really so often the thing that makes the great right. scientist, the person who seizes, takes opportunity out of what may look like failure at the first Yeah, I, I again tell a lot of the students, including my undergraduate class, that, you know, we see a lot of things. We use a lot of things. And many times it's, our, it's in our blood to take things for granted. And that doesn't take you much, you know. And there are different levels of seeing. For example, I can look at this table and say, you know, I see this form, right? But I can also look at it and say, uh, at this different level, there are atoms in it, there are planes in it, you know? So it depends on at what level you want to see things. The physical university, in some ways, still remains important, that having people who are doing very different things down the hall, resources that you can go to when you have something unexpected, yeah. that, that, that propinquity and location uh, help, still helps fuel science even the age of modern technology. Absolutely. I think, you know, the modern technology adds value, but it doesn't replace, you know, existing um, structures and uh, I think the best times and best inventions and discoveries or at least best research that we do in our lab come from really brainstorming, sitting together and, you know, suddenly somebody has a crazy idea and we g go in that direction, right? So I think the pleasure of doing that is not replaceable. The, uh, I did want to come back to the, the spray paintable uh, battery and uh, to the extent you could explain that to a lawyer. Uh, how does that work? How did you sort of come up with the idea? And so, <coughs> you know, battery is an area where a lot of researchers are uh, you know, strongly involved in and big corporations like Honda and other companies are involved in. So we wanted to really you know get into this energy storage business but we wanted to do something with a niche i mean something that is different so even you know several years ago um, we thought about this and i said to myself you know ma maybe what is fascinating uh, in some sense is how you can create new designs you know increase form factor so that you could have a battery or a storage device that would fit any particular uh, geometry any kind of structure um, and there has also been quite a bit of interest among uh, industry and defense uh, about this embedded kind of power and so on. Uh, so th there was this place for uh, some thinking and some innovation 
uh, in creating new designs for batteries or supercapacitors, energy storage devices. Uh, so the first thing we came up uh, many years ago was this paper battery. So we infused uh, the electrodes onto a paper, piece of paper, uh, and then built a device uh, from it which could act like a battery. Uh, so it was flexible, it was freestanding, you know, it was kind of a new kind of thing. And a lot of people were interested. Uh, so we, were, we have been thinking along these lines to see what is the next innovation. And there has been a lot of work done by people where they print, you know, batteries. And of course, printing is kind of uh, limited in terms of, uh, you know, spatial extent. Uh, and it also makes very thin. Uh, so all, all these uh, things happening in recent times, uh, you know, we, we were kind of thinking in the right direction, at least um, uh, we thought, so that we can really build something very new, some paradigm sh shift that I was mentioning at the beginning. And that's how th this idea of paintable battery came. Uh, I think there has been some precedent of people uh, thinking about such an idea, but it seemed difficult because there are many components in the battery and you have to basically pick every one of them and put them into an ink format and when you spray them together they don't really work very well because of all kinds of engineering problems. So I had a couple of wonderful students, um, Neelam uh, particularly was leading this effort, uh, you know, uh, I asked them to work on this and keep working on them until you get something and um, many times she was frustrated, she would come back and say, okay, this is not working, it's shorting. Uh, but then we, p we persisted and ultimately, you know, we got something that was working and you know once you kind of solve these engineering problems then it is much easier to kind of get the efficiencies and other things worked and out. Is, it practical, is, is this one coat of, of Well it's multiple or, or, coats. Or right. you need to you lay, put this down in layers and they become the different parts of the battery? So a battery typically has the current collector, the electrodes, uh, cathodes and anodes yeah. And then in between, there is this uh, separator, which is mostly polymer based with the electrolyte, which is the electrochemical uh, transport vehicle. Uh, so all these separate parts have to be, you know, uh, synthesized into this ink format, which can be sprayed. Uh, and so if you start with the uh, tiles, for example, that right, you use, right. how many then different layers do you have to put on the At tiles? At least six layers six in layers. this case, right. Uh, and it's, uh, well again, I mean, there are still some practical issues that we would love to solve because electrolytes are typically air sensitive and mm -hmm. there are some issues with that. So s if you want to do this right now, we still have to do th this in a glove box, right? So the next generation or the next level would be to create a solid electrolyte that you could uh, just simply paint outside, just like you would paint your house. I mean, if you reach that level, then you have really made a huge contribution. And like a lot of science and engineering, right. you, you can't know with certainty you'll be able to overcome each of those Absolutely. hurdles and right. you just have to keep pushing and yeah. see what the next problem is and you've made a terrific advance and now you're on to the next right. problem. I mean it's like carbon nanotubes. I started working on this material since it started at NEC and there were many applications initially they said would happen like uh, you know field emission display and things like that but with time you realize that you know there are other competing materials there are other factors that come into picture when you start commercializing and so on so we are doing basic research creating innovations you know discovering things and there is the next step and that is unpredictable many times one of you mentioned your grad graduate students and uh, you know i noticed whether it's in terms of the papers that you've published or even the videos we've done on these stories, how generous you are with your graduate students and giving them credit and providing their opportunities. I, I wanted to kind of ask you about the, the role of graduate students in, in terms of the work that you do and the science that occurs yeah. in universities. Well, I suppose I got that training from my own professor, you know, uh, and it always is like that. Uh, you, you get, uh, uh, you know, the right kind of training from who you worked with. Uh, but I feel that, uh, you know, the students should get training in the whole spectrum of things. You know, they are here uh, to learn, to understand, to create, uh, and also to present, uh, right? And many of the graduate students I have, ha I mean, especially the ones that have been on video and YouTube, they are, they are really excellent. I mean, they, I, I think they are smarter than me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, but I think, you know, more importantly, I insist that they get training. Uh, many of them are actually also doing internships in industry. They're going abroad. Uh, so, you know, I back in India, we used to talk about gurukulam, which is basically 
you know, the student would go and stay with the professor and learn everything. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not trying to do that, but, you know, at least I think it's important that the student get overall uh, training. No, I, I think your, your generosity toward those students and, and I, I think your confidence in them, the, your belief in their futures yep. and their abilities uh, just comes out really in, in that relationship. No, there's no better satisfaction than when a student does very well. Right? well I think that's very true. So, you know, you, you sort of mentioned, uh, you know, just the importance of materials and solving problems. Uh, I, I came in part to this conviction through a visit to my dentist and <laughs> where, where <laughs> I, I needed a crown or something. And what amazed me was it, it wasn't just about design or even mostly about design. It was about each of the different materials yeah. for a different function and the increasing precision of those materials for each, yeah. each function. So I, I wanted to kind of ask you broadly, you know, how you see the future of material science, what you see as the, the success and promise of rice in that in that field as mm -hmm. we look ahead. Well, I hope it's not the same dentist because the one I go to, we started talking and finally she wanted to collaborate with us on some of the materials. <laughs> uh, but again, you know, as you said, <coughs> a lot of technologies in all the way from biological to physical, uh, you know, sciences, involve materials and uh, battery uh, we already talked about solar cells i think all all these things are essentially built on the power of materials uh, material science has been a very old discipline you know it used to be uh, met metallurgy and ceramics and polymers together I mean separately but now it has become more modern material science and all the you know uh, big universities in this country and elsewhere have focus core programs in material science uh, again, I think, you know, it has become much more interdisciplinary than it used to be. So there are also people working with materials focus in other departments. Um, but as a core program, I came, you know, I graduated from a university with a strong materials uh, department. And also I worked in a place where there was a strong materials department. So in fact, w one of the things that attracted me to RISE was, uh, you know, the possibility of, you know, uh, spearheading some effort to concentrate materials uh, effort and maybe, you know, at some point of time even have a department of material science. Uh, but uh, uh, I think what the bottom line is that today at RISE we have very strong effort in materials spread across campus. In really in many different departments. In many different departments. Um, but again, when you start talking about core programs and education and, you know, giving degrees to students, you also need a uh, separate department. But yes, uh, very strong. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we were even ranked number one in terms of citations in material science. And just to kind of, um, uh, you know, for as far as the centennial celebrations are concerned, our contribution uh, right now is to actually bring out a special issue in advanced materials, which is the premier journal in material science, uh, to have a focus on materials of such a price. And that's a really great <coughs> recognition. I think as you've said, it hasn't always been consolidated, but if you look at right. what we all have, we, we really have a premier group of people working yeah. in this fundamental understanding of materials and, and what they can be applied to do and, and used right. for. And I think as your work uh, <coughs> suggests, it's in, it's in so many different areas. It's in energy, it's in the environment, it's in right. health. Absolutely. Uh, really almost every area we see the it, particularly the influence of nanotechnology as a, yeah. you know, what Rick Smalley really believed. There was probably oh, no absolutely. problem that Rick Smalley didn't believe wouldn't be solved by nanotechnology. Well, <laughs> yeah, he was, a, you know, strongly convinced that, that that's the solution. And in some sense, you know, nanotechnology is based on a length scale and a lot of the structures that we uh, are trying to make more sophisticated um, simply because things have gotten smaller and you can have more flexibility in building things. Now all of this, you know, science is very expensive. You know, this research and you know, it's a <coughs> difficult time for universities across the country, particularly public universities across the country. Right. Uh, and so how how do you see that in the future? You know, as you look around the world, uh, the the necessary funding to make these incredible advances, and you know, frankly, to to keep the United States at the forefront. Frankly, not only for our own benefit, but yep. for the world's benefit. To, provide these new materials, new knowledge, new solutions to problems. Uh, where do we stand in that yeah. as you see it? I th it's very frustrating to me and to many people, uh, I'm sure, uh, scientists, um, because you know there is nothing that serious funding that would allow you to do sustainable research over long periods of time. 
So most of the time what happens is that you have three year projects you know, from NSF, uh, which probably pays for a student or so. And then it kind of ends, and you know the chances of it being renewed, who knows? I mean, so I think that that is one of the things that uh, that, that really frustrates a lot of people. Uh, you know, I have close relationship with uh, funding agencies and other um, initiatives in Europe and other places, and I think fundamentally it differs from the U.S. in terms of providing more sustainable uh, funding to a particular project. I think here we are a little bit hasty in trying to get everything into you know, applications or products, um, but one has to realize that in academics we are training students, you know, this is basic research, so I, I would at least hope to see a little bit more patience on... I mean, the uh, typical know, graduate student you have spends how, how Four or five years. Four or right? five yeah. years, and as you think about your work, it, you don't just think about the things that you can accomplish within three years. Yeah, so in some sense, you know, may, uh, the PIs are forced to kind of go in that direction, which is really unfortunate, I think. Right. Um, but hopefully, you know, things will change. But uh, So these short funding cycles, in some ways, uh, undermine the traditional role of the universities, right. which is really emphasizing fundamental knowledge, the discovery of fundamental knowledge, and sort of the long term as yeah. compared, for example, to the private yeah, I th sector. I think we are going to lose a competitive edge if this continues for too long, um, especially because I think places like Europe have in the recent times woken up and you know started to put a lot of resources. Well, we thank you for the amazing contributions that, that you've made across a, a number of areas, and, <coughs> and, and not only these discoveries, but obviously the important educational role that you're playing in, in bringing attention to rice in terms of our strength in material science. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much, It's David. been great as we celebrate our centennial, and we celebrate you're being here as part of RICE for five years. That's too kind. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, you, Dr. John, for, for joining us for this wide-ranging and exciting conversation, I think, which has really shed a lot of light on not only what you do, but really the incredible work our faculty is doing every year across the campus. And we hope you'll join us uh, next time for our, our campus conversation, where we'll be talking about RICE's centennial. Until then, thanks so much for being part of the RICE community.